Do you like epic games, games that tell a story? Do you look for these unique PlayStations that you will remember for 20 years? Hello fellow gamers, I'm Jean-Michel Grosjeu and you're watching my series of videos where I tackle the rules of heavy games. And not only the rules, also some few basic strategies to help you feel comfortable at the game table. So here we go, it's time to overcome the silliness of my delicious French accent and take a seat together in front of that heavy game box. Welcome my friends, I'm Jean-Michel Grosjeu. Today, Jean-Michel Grosjeu goes for heavy stuff with the second edition of BIOS Megafauna, a game by Phil Eklund, published by Sierra Madre Games. It is the second of three titles, the BIOS series, intended to brace yourself to recreate the history of life on Earth from the primordial soup to space travel. The second opus, the one we are dealing with, is called BIOS Megafauna. It begins 450 million years ago in the Paleozoic era with the emergence of life from oceans and ends with the fall of the Chicxulub comet which wiped out dinosaurs 66 million years ago. The four players embody four different life forms. Plants in green, invertebrates in orange, insects in black and vertebrates in white. Here is what the play area looks like. In the center, you see a primitive planet Earth made up of continental plates holding living species. Next to it, a somehow abstracted representation of its atmosphere and climate, the so-called Reservoir Placard with its colorful tracks. Around these, the four players, each having a set of base cards for their animal or plant species, and more cards called mutations which represent their organs and anatomy. Finally, on top, a common area with a draw stack of even cards, a display of mutations available for purchase, etc. In this game, each player starts with a tiny critter and will attempt to settle the Earth over millions of years using further and more evolved species. Some consider Bios Megafauna as a convoluted game, but trust me, if you dig into it, it's not that bad. So let's start right away with my series of five videos. In the first one, the one you are watching right now, we'll take an overview of the main game concepts, its components, the game flow and the victory conditions. In the second video, we'll detail the core of the game, the player actions. Afterwards, we'll focus on those actions having consequences on the ground, the dispersal of species and the inevitable struggle when they meet. Then, in the fourth video, it'll be time to take an in-depth look at events, that is, all the quite unpredictable and nasty stuff that your species will have to adapt to. We'll complete this walkthrough with a study of various evolutionary traits, special powers that your critter can acquire through selected mutations, and finally, we will take a step back and share a few strategy tips. So, without further ado, let's discover the world of BIOS Megafauna. We've just landed on Earth 450 million years ago. Its landmass is made up of four cratons. This is a geological term for a chunk of crust drifting around because of tectonics. There are four cratons named Laurentia, Baltica, Siberia and Gondwana. Each is identified by a small symbol. Cratons are surrounded by an ocean, so deep and empty that no species can inhabit it. Each craton is made up of seven hexes called biomes. A biome is a unit of habitat that can foster the development of life. There are three biome types, weeds in green, sea in blue, and swamps in brown. Three types of discs can be placed on a biome to change its certain type. With the black disc, it becomes a mountain. With the white disc, a frozen desert. Mountains and frozen deserts are both uninhabitable, no life can survive in there. With a green disc, a biome becomes a forest that is, on the contrary, very hospitable to life. We already mentioned it, nothing can live in the deep ocean. But on the east coast of East Stratton, there are three available positions, three notches, which are called offshore location. 
Each can house a black disk representing underwater deposits. On top of this black disk, on this rock, you can stack a green disk which turns the offshore location into a kind of coral reef, a very propitious and fertile environment called Bloom. An offshore location cannot contain a white disk nor a green disk on its own, only a black disk or a green disk on top of a black disk. Now you must realize that the four cratons are spread over the surface of a globe-shaped Earth. They are in fact tectonic plates that can move over the geological times. You heard about it, it's called continental drift. First of all, cratons can move northward and southward independently of each other. To track their position, we use a cardboard ruler called the latitude strip. It divides the globe from north to south into eight zones. Thus, we can locate each craton according to the position, in other words, the latitude of its center. Here, for example, Laurentia would be at latitude 4, Baltica at latitude 2, etc. To make things easier during the game, there is a die on each craton showing its latitude. Cratons can also move eastward or westward, that is, without changing their latitude. That's how they can collide and create megacontinents, merging several cratons, like this for example. And because of Earth's sphericity, a craton that drifts beyond the western limit re-enters from the east and vice versa. Now let's have a quick look at the board simulating the global physical parameters of Earth's atmosphere. It features three tracks called reservoirs because they store the disk used in the game. The green reservoir represents oxygen, it holds the green disks. The white reservoir represents clouds, it holds the white disks. And the last, the rainbow reservoir, represents the greenhouse effect in the atmosphere, it can hold a mix of black and white disks. Let's take oxygen. Here, for example, the bottom most empty spot reads oxygen 7%. During the game, when forests appear on Earth, we remove green disks from the oxygen reservoir to place them on biomes where they become forests. If we look at the new oxygen level, now it has grown to 11%. So, as you can see, it is quite logical. The more forests on Earth, the higher the oxygen level and the better it is for animals, that is, for players orange, black and white. The cloud reservoir tends to favor plants, the green player. The best for her is a mid-range level where there are enough clouds for abundant rainfall, but not so many that they would block the sunlight. The last reservoir depicts the atmosphere temperature. A high temperature benefits plants, hence the green player. For her, the hotter the better, except that if the level reaches the top of the reservoir's track, a global disaster unfolds in the form of a runaway greenhouse effect, wiping out all life on Earth. In this case, players complete the current turn and then the game is over. Let's now deal with the living species. A species is represented by a set of wooden meeples, or more precisely, creeples. Each such creeple is called a population and stands for millions of individual plants or animals. A population lives in a biome, in other words, an hexagon. Here, for example, on Laurentia. A species is also a card in front of its player. This card is called the species genotype. Here is, for example, the genotype of orange player starting invertebrate species. This icon means that the species use dome-shaped cripples like this one we placed on the Laurentia Creton. The dome is the simplest living form and the one all players start with. It is called the archetype. In addition to the archetype, each player may develop species with different shapes, a burrowing, swimming, armored or flying species. Upon creating a new shape, the player receives seven population cripples he put on his corresponding genotype card. Note that in fact there can be only six populations on the genotype, because at least one must be developed somewhere in a biome, here for example on the Laurentia Creton. If at any point during the game a species has no more cripple on Earth, that species goes instinct and ceases to be. On every genotype card there is also a spot for a die, 
indicating the size of each individual plant or animal of this particular species. Initially, your archetype species has a size of 1, and during the game, the size can increase up to 6. As a rule of thumb, size 1 stands for small individual weighing tens of grams, while a size 6 would be a giant creature weighing 10 to 20 tons. And now, let's finish our tour with the skeletal number printed on top of the genotype. 1 is for the plant cytoskeleton. 2 is the invertebrates hydroskeleton, 3 is the insects exoskeleton, and 4 is for the endoskeleton of vertebrates. So, you have your species with this genotype and spare population. During the course of the game, over millions of years, this species is going to evolve, it will mutate. Each mutation is represented by a card like this one, for example, the gastric glands. A mutation, in general, adds a new organ to the species. Organs, in this game, are represented by colored cubes placed on a colored square with a plus symbol on the mutation card. To add an organ, just put there a cube of the matching color. The mutation card is then slid under the genotype card. And here we go, our orange invertebrate is now the proud owner of gastric glands. We've just seen a green mutation adding a green organ, that is a green cube. There are also blue, red and yellow mutations. Each mutation card has a reverse side which is an upgrade, an improved version, that we will explain in a later video. The game lasts about 15 turns, the exact number is not known beforehand, since the game ends with a random event when the Shigzulub comet crashes on Earth. Yes, Shigzulub, that's a funny name, but you should know it because this is that notorious comet that brought to end the dinosaur era. So, after 12 to 16 turns, the winner is the player who developed the species that are the most widespread on Earth and the most evolved. This is computed with victory points. Basically, you get one point per population, that is, per surviving creeper on a biome. In addition, add one point for each species you created, even if it went extinct. Finally, there are additional victory points for a few specific evolutionary traits, mutualism, emotions, tools and language. Anyway, this is just a high-level view to give you a taste of it, and we will revisit all victory conditions in depth in a later video. Ok, we will stop here this first video, it was just an overview. What's next? Well, there are four more videos which walk through the game in detail. And to begin with, let's meet again soon in the second video where we will dive into the core of the game, the player actions.